If you would, open up your Bibles with me to the book of Mark as we continue our series through this book in Mark chapter 1. And it has been such, such a joy to so far go through this, this book, even though we're only just now 20 verses in. It has just been very enriching to my soul to really walk with the, the, uh, the, the Apostle Mark. And, um, or the disciple Mark, I should say, and uh, and behold the truth of Scripture that is uh, that is here for us to behold the, the truth of the gospel. Ultimately, this is this is gospel truth. All of this concerning Jesus and his ministry and his preaching and his teaching, and uh, ultimately we know it culminates in Mark covering his death, burial, and resurrection on our behalf. So we're going to specifically look at verse 21, and we're going to go all the way down to verse 28. So I'll read those now, and then I will pray. We'll get into looking at this text and, uh, and other passages as well that speak to the, to the similar subjects that are put forth uh, in, this, in this section. So Mark writes in verse 21 of Mark chapter 1. He says, They went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue and began to teach. They were amazed at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one having authority, and not as the scribes. Just then there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, What business do we have with each other, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. Throwing him into convulsions, the unclean spirit cried out with a loud voice and came out of him. They were all amazed, so that they debated among themselves, saying, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. Immediately, the news about him spread everywhere into all the surrounding district of Galilee. Let's pray. Father, as I stand before your people, I take upon myself this great task. I pray for grace. I pray for the hearers, Lord. Even my own soul, as I glean truth from the preached word, I pray that each and every one of us would be greatly transformed by the truth of Scripture. And as I prayed earlier, Lord, if there's anyone who knows not of the saving grace of Christ, I pray that through this sermon, they would be raised to spiritual life. Father, we praise You. We praise You for Your Word, the sufficiency of Your Word, the authority of Your Word, the power. There is, there is power in the Scriptures and the truths that are conveyed therein. We praise You for Your sovereign Working in all things. Your providence. We praise you that we can take comfort in knowing that all things are working for our good and for your glory. And so it is our prayer that you would be glorified in us, in this church, in the preached word, and in all things forever. Amen. Amen. The title of this sermon is... Jesus astounds. Jesus astounds. What a true fact that is. What a true statement that is. Two simple words. One, of course, is the subject, Jesus. And the other is what he brings about, what he affects. And that is astonishment. Christ, in his person, in his work, in all that he does... He astounds. There is this reality is illustrated all throughout Scripture, both in the Old and the New Testaments, that Jesus Christ astounds. Even the prophets of old themselves were in all the glory of Christ. And of course, the gospel writers were also 
greatly astounded. They were in awe of the power of the gospel. We think about Paul. We think about Paul on the road to Damascus, who, when he was there going to persecute Christians, the risen Christ appeared and he was astounded. We think about in Jesus' teaching, He astounded. We think about in Jesus' healing ministry, He astounded. We think about in Jesus' exorcisms and casting out demons, He astounded. And two of those are put forth here. Specifically, Jesus' teaching ministry, how it astounded. And His casting out of demonic dark forces, how in that He also astounded. And so those are a couple of the truths that we're going to consider in this text. In Mark 1, 21 through 28. But before we look at those, of course, we must consider our context. Where Mark has already brought us and where he is going to bring us in the future. As we saw last week in verses 16 through 20, Jesus called his first disciples, called Simon and Andrew, or Peter and Andrew, James and John. He called them from their fishing um, jobs that they were employed with and that they were taken up with. And he simply used the phrase, follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. We know also that these men had already been acquainted with Christ and this wasn't their first time seeing Jesus, but it was certainly the first time he called them unto discipleship. And of course we know as verse 18 reads, immediately they left their nets and followed him. Verse 20, immediately he called them and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and they went away and followed him. That's referencing James and John. Verse 18 is referencing Simon and Andrew. So Jesus came, called, and these men left for Christ's glory. They left to serve the risen Savior. They themselves were astounded by the glory of Christ. In fact, uh, we know that uh, uh, excuse me, Luke later expounds upon what Mark has written here. And in his own take on, on what happened when Jesus appeared there at the Sea of Galilee and the miraculous catch of fish with Simon, that uh, he, he said to the Lord Jesus, he says, Lord, depart from me, I'm a sinful man. There's, a, there's, an, a, there's an aspect of astonishment there uh, on, on the disciples and on the fishermen and probably who were around them and saw this great catch of fish. Jesus manifested his glory to them. And to just continue on in the narrative of astonishment and Christ manifesting the power of God, we find ourselves in verses 21 through 28. We find ourselves considering how, in other ways, Jesus manifested his glory and his power. And so there are three, three aspects. This text breaks up very cleanly into three parts. Firstly, it is the aspect where Jesus is teaching, and that's in verses 21 through 22. And then the second part is where Jesus casts out a demon, and that's in verses 23 through 26. And then thirdly, the crowd's astonishment, and that's in verses 27 and 28. And so let us consider those each one at a time, first beginning with Jesus' teaching, beginning there in verse 22. It says, they went into Capernaum. So at this point in Jesus' ministry, he had moved from Nazareth, which is where he was raised. Now he's born in Bethlehem, raised in Nazareth, and by this point he's moved his home to Capernaum. This is really the home base for his ministry. This is Jesus' home base for all the ministry he's going to conduct. We know that because in chapter 2, verse 1, what does it say? When he had come back to Capernaum several times, Days afterward, it was heard that he was at home. Christ Jesus, our Lord, uh, at this point in his ministry, was dwelling here in Capernaum, and it was really a, it was on, it was situated on the northwest shore of the Sea of Galilee, and it was really a, a a good central location for his Galilean ministry, and really for a lot of other ministry. And it, and it wasn't too far from Judea; it was just a good place to be. Also, there was a, a, a there was a presence of Roman soldiers there as well. It was a it was a bustling town, a huge fishing industry there on the Sea of Galilee as well as we considered last week. And so here they come into Capernaum, Jesus and his four newly obtained disciples. And then it says, and immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue, 
and began to teach. This is important, firstly, because it says immediately on the Sabbath. And brethren, this is something that we ought to observe from our Lord. Jesus, being our chief example, the perfect example for us to follow, observed the Sabbath day. He observed the day which God had set aside to rest. Brethren, this is an implicated exhortation unto us that we as well ought to be diligent to observe the day of rest that God has set apart for us in the new covenant. We know that day has moved from the last of the week to the first. We now find ourselves on this day, the Lord's Day, or what is sometimes called the Christian Sabbath. It is fitting that we observe this day, brethren, to rest and to set it aside to worship God. Of course, not that we do not worship any other day of the week, but there is something special about the Lord's Day. We mark the fact that our Lord Jesus chose on this day to rise from the dead, to appear to His disciples many times in this single span of this 24-hour period. Christ, being in obedience to the law, kept the Sabbath. And we would do well as Christians who have been redeemed by Christ and who are now empowered to fulfill the law. See, brethren, the law does not go away once we become Christians. The laws, in terms of condemning power, is gone. And the fact that even though we do not keep the law and we fail and we, have, we, we see our guilt, Christ has paid for it, it's gone. He's put away our guilt, that's true. But the law is there for the Christian life. And it's there for us to live by, to abide by. We are empowered by the Holy Spirit to live in obedience to the law. In fact, I considered this very thoroughly uh, back in uh, a couple of months ago as we went through our series on the fruit of the Spirit. We talked about how the Holy Spirit enables us to fulfill the law. That was all of Paul's argument in Galatians 5. His whole argument was the Spirit of God enables you to keep the law of God. That's, it's not that once you become a Christian, the law is gone, you do whatever you want. Or once you become a Christian, the Spirit leads you and there's, there's, no, there's, there's, there's no external commands. You just, you just do however you feel. Certainly not. We have a guide. We have a moral compass and it's the law of God. And the Spirit of God enables us to keep that. You want to know if someone is Holy Spirit empowered is whether they keep the law of God. So Jesus, of course, having, having been anointed by the Spirit, as we, as we saw a couple of weeks ago in the previous verses, as the Spirit had already descended upon Him, enabled Him, empowered Him to fulfill His ministry, it is therefore fitting that He comes along and is fulfilling the law, is keeping the law. But it is certainly separate from our keeping the law because His keeping is absolutely impeccable and perfect. And so it says, then, he entered the synagogue. Now, what was the synagogue? That was practically, you could say, there, there was a, there's some connection between what we would consider a church. It was basically the local church where the people would meet. It was the place where they gathered together. Interestingly enough, uh, first century synagogues were, all, were not only used for church, but it was really a, it was a community building. It was used for a lot of different things. Education, uh, events, uh, communal meals. Of course, one of, the need, uh, one of the uses was the actual worship of God. And it was, I was researching last night, it was very, or uh, last, uh, yesterday afternoon, it was very enriching to consider that. In the synagogue, there was actually, they discovered this uh, just a few years ago, they discovered a first century synagogue in Israel. And uh, in the middle of it, toward the back of the building, in the center of the room, there was a, a little podium. And they said that's where they would take the scroll and open it up, and the teacher, whoever's teaching, would read and, of course, exegete, exegete the text, very similar to what a sermon would be. So it's interesting the parallels between what we are uh, experiencing even right now at this very moment. There's, this pulpit is in the center of the room, and the Word of God is being preached, brought forth at this very moment. So it's very interesting that there's a lot of, there's a lot of connection there. And Jesus, of course, enters the Sabbath, or enters the synagogue on the Sabbath, and what does He do? He begins to teach... Now, this is important. Jesus was a rabbi. Jesus was a Jewish rabbi. We need to remember contextually, culturally, historically what's going on here. Jesus was a, was a respected, for the most part, of course, among his disciples and followers, and even some of the people who were more neutral, uh, as a rabbi. He was venerated as a rabbi. In fact, uh, if you would, turn with me to, to John. We see this put forth in, in, in the uh, Gospel of John. John chapter 1 <clears throat> Uh, beginning in verse 35, it says, Again, the next day, John was standing with two of his disciples. And he looked at Jesus as he walked and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. Verse 37, the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. And Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, 
What do you seek? They said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher. Where are you staying? So here they were following after John. They were following after John's ministry and teaching. And John points to Jesus. And so they start following after Christ. And they, they address him as Rabbi and follow after him. And of course, we know later on that uh, one of those men who was following after Jesus was Andrew. And obviously, we know from Mark's account that Andrew was later called by Jesus to follow after him, to be one of his disciples. Also in John 3, uh, verse 2, it says, This man came to Jesus. Now that's Nicodemus. This man came to Jesus by night and said, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher. So again, historically, culturally, what's going on? In their minds, in the minds of the people who are around Jesus, this man was a venerated, God-sent rabbi. It's interesting, uh, Jew, young Jewish boys underwent rigorous, rigorous learning. By, at the age of five, they were sent away to memorize the entire Old Testament or, or what they had at that point. They had the Pentateuch, the writings, and the prophets. And so they would memorize <coughs> word for word those texts of Scripture uh, then, later on, uh, at, by the age of 13, with their bar mitzvah, they would continue on more studying and more. And the ones who showed more promise, the ones who showed more interest in the things of, of God and spiritual things, would press on more and more and more. They'd study, they'd study, they'd study. And by, uh, <clears throat> by the age of 30, they were in the full vigor of life. They were, they were considered, that was a full, that was really the commencement, the beginning of the ministry. For them, as a rabbi, as a venerated elder. And it's interesting, when did Jesus begin his, begin his public ministry? At the age of 30. What was Jesus doing during, during those years? Well, what, what was a Jewish young boy doing? He was learning, he was studying. We know from uh, Luke's account, he was in the temple asking questions. And it says that the, the, the uh, chief priests of Pharisees were astonished by the questions he was asking. Astonished. They were astounded by what he was saying, the questions he was asking. It's because Jesus was learning, he was diligent in learning. Interesting also to note that in uh, first century Israel, the rabbis, uh, of course, being teachers and regarded as, as men who understood the scriptures, who could explain the scriptures. It wasn't that they knew the scriptures. Everyone knew the scriptures. Everyone, all, all the Jewish boys had to memorize the scriptures. They knew them. The, 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 the issue was how to interpret and, and to, to teach the truth that's brought forth in scripture. Now, that, that was the question. And that was, that was what a rabbi did. They explained, they taught their disciples the truth, uh, the truth from Scripture. It's interesting to note also that these, that these rabbis in first century Israel chose their disciples. They would, they would choose the, the men whom they saw were showing most promise and most commitment to them. They would choose them and they'd be set apart. And they would follow after them. And Jesus, of course, in like manner. So we understand culturally, we know from verses, in verses 16 to 20 of Mark 1, when, as we saw last week when Jesus called his disciples, what's going on there culturally? Jesus is calling these men to be his disciples as their rabbi. But it's, of course we know spiritually this is much more than that. But it's good to know the background. It's good. When we study scripture, we don't, a lot of people say, well, you've got to bring the Bible into our modern day. No, we've got to bring the modern day reader back into biblical times. We've got to bring the mindset of the modern reader back into biblical times. Such a, I'd say 99% of misinterpretation of Scripture or misunderstanding of Scripture comes from a lack of contextualization. You don't understand either the textual context or the historical context or the cultural context, and therefore the Scripture uh, is very much so confusing to you. But it's not when we understand those things typically. About 99% of the time it's, it's resolved whatever issue is found there in the text. And so as a rabbi, of course, he had the prerogative to do what? To enter into the synagogue and teach. We know from Mark's account, I read it a couple weeks ago in one of my sermons, where Jesus entered in the synagogue, and, uh, or excuse me, not Mark's account, I'm sorry, Luke's account, where Jesus entered in the synagogue, and he, they read Isaiah 61, uh, verse 1, when he talks about the Spirit of the Lord anointing the Messiah, and he says, this text has been fulfilled in your hearing, and that was in Nazareth, and they were offended, because they knew him. They knew him. Just imagine that. Imagine, imagine uh, in your own community, a young man studious. A religious, uh, learned student coming in and saying something like that. They were offended by that. Offended. So ended up, obviously, he's been moved to Capernaum. And uh, that was the base of his ministry from then on out. So he's teaching the Word of God. And it's authoritative. It's authoritative. How do we know that? Look at verse 22. Uh, back in Mark 1. It says, They were amazed at his teaching. For he was teaching them as one having authority and not as the scribes. They were astounded. 
Ekpleso. They were astounded, which means to strike. They were struck with astonishment. It, it carries with a sense of a force. There's force to what he's saying. And not as the scribes. Not as the scribes. In Jesus' day, the scribes, the men who, who gave themselves to the study of scriptures and interpretation of scriptures, most of their interpretation was just built on layer upon layer upon layer of, of rabbinical teaching. Where, oh, this guy said this and this guy said that. They're just, they're going off of each other. And there's no, what does the text say? Let's get to the text. Let's deal with the passage itself. It's more of a, just a, 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 a rabbinical tradition. And it becomes empty. And we know that was one of the greatest rebukes Jesus gave to the Pharisees and scribes. The chief priests. Was that they had their religion, what? Built off of traditions of men. It was not biblical. It was, it was an unbiblical religion. It was unbiblical if they had stayed true to the scriptures of the Old Testament, they would have the gospel. They would have the true gospel message of Christ. These things are not unclear from the Old Testament. We were just studying earlier in Sunday school. In Genesis 1, just two chapters over, we find the first inklings of the gospel. Right there, after the fall of man, God provides, the Lord provides salvation. And He promises the, soul, the, the skull-crushing seed of the woman to destroy the works of Satan. To, to, un, to undo what Satan has done. And so they were amazed at Jesus' teaching. For he was teaching them as one having authority. Now, when the word of God is brought forth, this is important. When the word of God is brought forth, there is authority to it. There is authority to the scriptures. Oftentimes, when I'm studying for sermons, I, I will find... Some, sometimes a commentator or sometimes someone online, uh, maybe a theological writer, discussing some side issue to the passage and getting into, well, some believe this, some believe that. I try not to get into all of the dif differing opinions. I want to know what does the text say? What does the text explicitly say? That is, that's the point. We're not to be, we're not to be distracted by, well, does it imply this, does it imply that, what it was... When you go off to the side, what does the text say? What does it mean? You, you could put it in three steps. What does the text say? That's step one. Step two, what does it mean by what it says? And then you can add a third one on here for personal application. How does this apply to me? How does this apply to my life? Uh, the, the Word of God ought to be properly applied to the heart. And that is where, uh, of course, the Holy Spirit comes in in His ministry, applying that to the hearts of the hearers. And it also is the responsibility of the hearer to apply it to their own heart as well. But it is authoritative. The Word of God has power. Uh, Hebrews 4.12, the Word of God is alive and active. It searches the inner man. One of my um, favorite preachers, uh, Dr. Stephen Lawson, he says, I've read many books, but the Bible reads me. And I think that is so true. The Scriptures... There, there is a, there's an aspect where the scriptures are so powerful. There, there, it's, it's, there's an organic aspect to it. It's not just writing. It's not just, it's not just words on a page. There, there's, there, the truth therein, the truth that is put forth in scripture is powerful. That's why Paul could later write in Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Where do we know about the gospel from? Holy scripture. Where is our faith built upon? Holy Scripture. And so Paul's saying here, the truth that is put forth in Holy Scripture is the dynamis of God, the, the power of God. And he said the same thing later in, in 1 Corinthians 1.18 as well. He taught them with authority. Uh, Jeremiah 23.29, the Lord says, Is not my word like fire, declares the Lord. And like a hammer which shatters a rock. God's word is powerful and effective. Well, well, in evangelism, when we are evangelizing and sharing the gospel of the lost, what's one of the most effective tools we can use? The word of God. It is a, it is a hammer which shatters rock. We think about a, a, someone's heart. We think about a sinner's heart. How does the Old Testament prophets describe the heart of man? Stony. A stony heart. So what do we do? We take the, the word of God and we crush it. We smash it. That Christ might mend them. That the healing balm of Gilead, the, the balm of the gospel, might bring healing to their souls. In fact, when we, when we share the gospel, this is interesting. When we share the gospel, we must, fall, we must first begin by 
Not sharing the gospel, but bringing the law. Bringing the law of God. The, the character and holiness of God. We have to confront the sinner with the reality of God's holiness and his character and their sinful character. I said it this morning in Sunday school. We can only understand the grace of God insofar as we have understood our sin. You, you, they are directly, inseparably tied. They are inexorably linked to, to one another. If you think little of sin, you're going to think little of the Savior. In fact, I say ministries that don't think much of sin, the Spirit of God's not at work. The Holy Spirit's not at work in a ministry that does not preach on sin, does not preach about hell, and does not preach on God's wrath against sin. Because you cannot, you cannot exposit, you cannot display, you cannot put God's love and mercy as it is revealed in Christ on display unless you first show the sinner the horror of their plight. In fact, I remember reading about a Puritan. I forgot who it was. Uh, came here to the United States before the United States was the United States, uh, the, the colonies. <clears throat> and he ministered among um, Native Americans. And um, he used a technique where he would um, preach a sermon one Sunday to them. And he would preach on hell and sin and God's wrath. And only that, not an... Not an ounce of good news. All bad news. And he closed the sermon and leave. And then the whole week, these people would, would wallow in what they heard. Wallow. There would be almost a marinating process going on. There would be this, this grieving. And by the time the next week rolled around, by the time that next Sunday came around, these people are, 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 are dying. They're, 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 they're itching to hear something. Anything, so an inkling of good news. I bet if he had gotten up and just said, Jesus saves, they would have said, We believe on him, we believe. Because they were, they were just longing for salvation. And um, I do remember that uh, it's saying that when he preached the sermon, he preached on Christ and the grace of Christ, that uh, they wept. They wept. The people were weeping. Why? Because they understood their plight. The Word of God's powerful, but it's got to be used. The, the sword is sharp, but it's got to be wielded. The hammer is strong, but it's got to be a swung. It's got to be brought forth. The lion is vicious, but the cage has to be open. The sinner's heart has got to be broken so that Christ can mend it. Otherwise, they'll just be proud, self-righteous Pharisees who will be lost. Why do we find ourselves here in the Bible Belt with false converts everywhere, just out the wazoo, all over the place? They never understood the law. They never understood their plight. They never understood the bad news. And therefore, the good news is of, of little meaning to them because Christ is of little meaning to them because they don't understand the gravity of their sin. They've heard weak evangelical preaching They've heard weak evangelical preaching. This, this broad Southern Baptist preaching where the, the, the preacher will say, do you know you've sinned? Okay, all right, let's move on. Do you know you've sinned? That's it? That's all you're going to say? You know you've sinned? You know you broke God's law? Okay, let's go on. Jesus has a wonderful plan for your life. Believe on Him be saved. Now come on down. Let's play some music. Open, open up your heart to Jesus. Friends, we have to, brethren, we have to expose the horror of sin, the, 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 the filth of iniquity. You know, we, we, we just studied this morning in chapter 6 of the London Baptist Confession on the fall of man, of sin, and of the punishment thereof. And we, we discussed how the fall happened. And it was that one act of disobedience. And look, the whole world thrown into chaos. Man cast out of the garden. People dead in sin. Haters of God. Rebellious. All because of one foolish act of sin. That's the nature of iniquity. We think about men whose ministries have been destroyed by sexual immorality. One sin brought it all down. One act of perversion destroy their witness. Because of the power 
of sin. So we need to expose sin so we can expose the sinner to the Savior of sin, from sin. And so the word of God is immensely powerful. We also considered, uh, last week, Peter's preaching in Acts 2. In Acts 2 and 3 and 4. 3,000 souls, and then Acts 4 later on it says 5,000 souls. That was powerful preaching because the word was brought forth. In fact, we saw in Acts 2, the preaching was so powerful, the sinners gave the invitation. The sinners said, what must we do? They interrupted him. He said, repent and be baptized to every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And so there was authority to Jesus' teaching. And therefore, it astounded the hearers. Secondly, I want us to consider when Jesus cast out a demon and how he astounded by doing that. Beginning in verse 23. There is almost a break here. There seems to be a natural break here. But um, in, like in my Bible, there, there, is not a cha- there is not a paragraph break because it, it says just then. So it's as if as he's teaching, or perhaps right when he's finished, this, this, is, this event is right back to back. It happens immediately afterward. Just then there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit. So, first off, what does it mean, an unclean, unclean spirit? Well, this is a phrase that is used often in the Gospels, and it describes a spirit that is sinful. So there's a sinful spiritual being inside someone else possessing a man. So, well, who else would that be? Well, let, well, obviously it's not an angel, because angels are holy. We know Jesus called angels holy in Luke 9. We obviously know, certainly it's not, not a member of the Trinity. So it's not God, it's not an angel of God. And so that leaves us only Satan himself, and it's clearly not indicated in the text, and that leaves us only with demons. And that's precisely what this is. But to understand uh, the background of, of demons and Satan, we first need to go f- uh, first to Satan himself and his fall. Turn with me to Isaiah 14, if you would, for a brief moment. As we consider f- Satan's fall, Satan's fall from heaven. Verse 12, the text reads, how, how you have fallen from heaven, O star of the morning, son of the dawn. You have been cut down to the earth. You who have weakened the nations. But you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. And I will sit on the mount of the assembly in the recesses of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. Nevertheless, you will be thrust down to Sheol, to the recesses of the pit. So this is describing the background of Satan's fall. Because we see, when we look at the narrative of Genesis, we find that uh, it talks about God creates everything, everything's good, and then, all of a sudden, Adam and Eve are in the garden, and there's this serpent that shows up. It's just assumed that the reader knows who the serpent is, what the background is to that. Uh, and here Isaiah later on uh, gives clarity to what happened. Well, why did Satan fall? What was the motive? What happened? And here's what it was. One word. It was pride. James 4, 6. God is opposed to the proud but gives grace to the humble. Satan was prideful. We know from Ezekiel's uh, narrative, uh, Ezekiel's writing, that uh, Satan was a cherub. Was one of the, one of the most, in fact, it talks about how he was a beautiful angel. Probably he was one of the best angels, maybe the best, maybe, maybe, maybe the archangel. Lucifer. And at some point, we are not sure when this happened, but uh, certainly it was sometime between after the creation period and before the fall. There is a period, and we don't know, this could have been years. Adam and Eve could, maybe decades, the, the garden could have, this could have been happening. We're not sure, it could have been days or weeks, it could have been just hours. We're not sure. I would probably give it some period of time uh, to elapse because the fall of Satan seems like a quite colossal event. And so he exalts himself, verse 13. He says, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God and I will sit on the mount of the assembly. So in other words, what he's saying is, I'm going to be God. I want to be like God. He was not satisfied in his position of authority, his high position as one of the angels of God, and therefore he fell That's why God promises in verse 14, or excuse me, verse 15, Nevertheless, you will be thrust down the shield to the recesses of the pit. So Satan is cast out of heaven. He is is barred from the presence of God in the sense that 
an, he is no longer an angel of God and the ho a holy angel of God, but now a fallen angel. And now we know from the rest of Scripture's testimony, he is the adversary, he's the accuser of the brethren, he's the deceiver, he's the liar, he's Satan, he's the enemy of God. And we know, of course, that he will be set apart, and he has been set apart for damnation. And hell has been prepared for him and his angels. Speaking of his angels, we have to go all the way to Revelation. It's interesting. Revelation 12, beginning of verse 3. Now, this is a, the Revelation, of course, is highly symbolic literature. But here in this highly symbolic passage, we find truth concerning, concerning Satan and the fall of Satan. And him taking uh, angels along with him, deceiving angels. Uh, verse 3 says, Then another sign appeared in heaven. And behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his head were seven diadems. And his tail swept away a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she gave birth, he might devour her child. Verse 9, skip down to verse 9. And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old who is called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. So this text implies that that one third of stars is talking about are angels. And so when Satan falls, apparently there's this rebellion happening. There's this in-house rebellion in heaven. And Satan deceives one third of the angels. We don't know how many there are, but there's a great vast number of angels. Uh, thousands, maybe millions, I don't know. Thousands of thousands upon angels. And he deceives them. And they rebel against God. And they're obviously cast out. God is almighty. And how dare anyone try and attempt to resist his holy reign. And so Satan and his angels are cast out. They are cast out from heaven. But they are allowed. Interestingly, we know from the book of Job, Satan is allowed access into heaven. And we know that from the book of Revelation, that Satan is the accuser of the brethren, and it falls up with this phrase, who accuses us, or accuses them, you know, brethren, before our God day and night. Satan has access to heaven. We're not sure if that has been discontinued since the cross, but we know in Old Testament times that he had access to heaven. Certainly not as the position he had before, but as a limited position. And we know from that narrative from Job, the conversation that took place between God and Satan himself. So Satan falls from heaven, and one third of the angels are taken with him. So now the nature of Satan and his angels are, they're all fallen angels, they're sinful, they're evil, they're wicked, they're in total opposition to God, and they are de they're deceivers, they're deceptive. That's why Paul warned in Titus chapter 2, verse 15, he said, these things speak, oh, excuse me, I'm sorry, not Titus 2, um, I apologize for that, in uh, 1 Timothy 4.1, or four, yeah, four one. I'm sorry about that. It says, but the Spirit explicitly says that in latter times some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. So one of the works of demonic forces and Satan is to deceive. We know Second Corinthians uh, four that uh, one of Satan's main uh, uh, strategies, one of one of his main works he engages in is what is blinding unbelievers, blinding unbelievers from seeing the gospel, seeing the glory of the gospel. And so there is a battle going on uh, between spiritual forces of good and evil. But we know ultimately from Colossians uh, that what happened? When Jesus died, he destroyed the works of the devil and he made a public display, made a spectacle of spiritual dark forces. We know elsewhere in the New Testament it says Jesus came and destroyed the works of Satan. That's in 1 John 4. So, Jesus has come and obliterated that. We also know even in the Old Testament days before Jesus came, Satan's power was greatly limited. Satan only can do what God allows him to do. And God uses Satan. And Satan, of course, thinks he is, he is, he is bringing about some sort of rebellion or bringing about something against the Lord. But there will be absolutely nothing that is brought up before God that will not be destroyed. Certainly, whatever Satan endeavors to bring up against the Lord will be obliterated. And so going back to Mark 1.23, now we have a good understanding of these dark forces. Obviously, one of the things they do from this text clearly is that they possess people. They will possess people. 
And it seems to be something that was very common in Jesus' day. And I think it's very common these days. Sadly, our society makes no room for that. We live in a secular society for the most part now. And uh, what is, I think, oftentimes described as a mental illness or as something that needs to be medicated or as something that needs ther- therapy is demonic possession, brethren. We need to be discerning. There, there are many, if there were, if we read through the Gospels, it was common, very, very common for Jesus to cast out demons. People were just all over the place being possessed. And what happened? Do you, you think the demons all died off? No, we know from Scripture that they're not going to until uh, the last judgment, until they're cast into hell. They're, they have, God in His brilliance and in His sovereignty gives them rain. He gives them gives them things to do. He, he in His sovereignty allows them to possess people. And I believe many people are. I believe many people are demonically possessed. Even to, these, to this day. And so uh, this unclean spirit is, is in this man. And then it says in verse 23, and he cried out. So I'm sure this was quite disruptive. Verse 24, 24 saying, what business do we have with each other? Jesus the Nazarene. Now that's an interesting phrase. It's found in the Old Testament. And it indicates, and it's not, it's, not a, it's not a question necessarily, it's not necessarily a question. It's more of a phrase that is used to separate someone from someone else. It's more of a contending phrase, what business do we have with each other? It's, it's more, it carries with it more of a sense, and you'd have to go back and read the Old Testament record, uh, I think it's out of 2 Samuel, where that, is, where that phrase is found. And it, it is more of a contending phrase. And so I'm sure that the whole, this spirit is, is disgusted and repulsed by Christ. But then listen to what he says. Have you come to destroy us? So almost a taunting, but also we see a, a, a tinge of, of fear and, and probably a, a genuine, what is he going to do? He's got sovereign power. He's the king. And then the spirit says, I know who you are, the Holy One of God. This is bad. You think, why? Why is it bad that he said that? And why is it bad that this, that this spirit would cry out and say that in the midst of the synagogue? Because we know from, um, from later on in um, Mark and also in Matthew that what, what was one of the things the Pharisees accused Jesus of doing? Of casting out demons by the, by the power of Beelzebub, by the power of the ruler of demons, by Satan himself. They were saying Jesus is in compact, he's in agreement with Satan, and he's using Satan's powers to cast out demons. He was actually, a, he was really, they're really saying he was a, a borderline Satanist, is what they were claiming. And obviously we know Jesus said that um, that was blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. They were blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Unforgivable sin. And so here... This spirit is, is, is actually saying something that is true. It's true that Jesus is the Holy One of God. And this is not good in a sense of, from the, the perspective of the people who are sitting in the synagogue, it further relates Jesus with this demonic force. It shows, whoa, this, this spirit knows Jesus. They, they, he knows who he is. It, it relates him to one another. It joins him to one another. And that's why later on, they brought this up to Jesus. They said, you're casting out demons by the power of Satan. That's why in verse 25 it says, And Jesus rebuked him. Why would Jesus rebuke a demon for speaking truth? Because it was not good. It was in the eyes of the people who were watching. It was, it was linking them. But we ultimately know it was truth. It was true. Jesus is the Holy One of God. And interesting, the phrase he uses, the Holy One of God, that's, that is an Old Testament phrase. And it was only used in the Old Testament for Yahweh. It's very interesting. Even the demons believe Jesus is God. Even the demons know Jesus is God. We know from Psalm 71, verse 22, that uh, the psalmist says to God, You are the Holy One of Israel. And I hear that same phrase as used, the Holy One of God. There's only one Holy One. There's not two Holy Ones. Otherwise, the Holy One would not be the Holy One. Christ is God. He possesses the full being of God. The full essence and nature of God. And so herein we see, we see power. This is Jesus' power is, is 
Incredible. He's the Almighty. He has all might, all power, and all strength. And so verse 25, And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet, come out of him. Just that simple. Verse 26, Throwing him into convulsions, the unclean spirit cried out with a loud voice and came out of him. So here we see the power of Christ manifested. That the Spirit quickly escapes this man. And verse 27, what do we find? They were all amazed. Jesus amazes. His teaching amazed people. His, his casting out demons amazed people. The works that Jesus did brought testimony. They bore testimony to the power of Christ. In fact, we know that um, from John 8, Jesus told the Jews, He said, if you won't believe on account of my words, believe on account of the miracles. That's what they were for. That's what they were for. And just, I'll briefly make a note on this, because I've been studying this recently, concerning miracles. Um, obviously, we have a lot of uh, our brethren, charismatic brethren, Pentecostals, and uh, they, they like to claim that... Uh, uh, speaking, on, speaking in tongues, miraculous things are going on. I, I encountered one man one time and he asked me, he said, do you believe uh, in raising the dead? I was like, yeah, I, I believe in raising the spiritual dead by the power of the Spirit of God. You're raising people to spiritual life. But no, certainly not. I was like, I don't, I've never heard of anybody, ever. In, 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 really, you know, the last 500, 1900 years of church history doing that. Uh, raising anybody from the dead. Confirmed. Uh, raising someone from the dead. And anyways, he went on to describe um, one of his, uh, someone he admired. Uh, by the name of, um, I forgot his name now, um, Todd Bentley was his name, Todd Bentley, and a famous uh, charismatic um, preacher, teacher, and uh, he uh, uh, claimed to raise many dead people and do many miracles. Anyways, come to find out, he was involved in a, in a sexual scandal, and basically his ministry came to nothing, but um, led a revival, supposedly, in, in Tampa, Florida, for, I think it was 18 months long, I mean, like every night. And uh, there was supposedly revival, and people were, you know, this and that, and nothing came of it at all. And uh, many people moved there, sold everything, just moved to Tampa, Florida, and lived there as this revival was going on. And back in 2008, and now nothing. You know, Tampa is still a wicked city, and people who sold everything probably are very poor now, and um, certainly have not spiritually, in the long run, nothing, nothing's gained from that. But, anyways, in terms of miracles, the Pentecostals are our brethren. We need to be very gracious in explaining this to them. But they forgot, they missed the whole point of what a miracle is meant for. What is the purpose of miracles biblically? To validate the, the, the man or uh, sent by God. That is the point of miracles. We see it in Moses. We see it in Elijah. We see it in Elijah's ministry. We see it in the prophets. We see it in Jesus and the apostles. Every time, they, every time these men did miracles, it was for this one purpose. To bring validation that they were sent by God. So miracles are no longer necessary, and they don't happen. They've ceased. They're gone. Why? Because the message of that, that we have from God is complete. The canon of Scripture is closed. It's done. The Word of God is sufficient. That's why as, uh, we as Baptists believe in what's called the sufficiency of Scripture. That is, the Bible is enough. We don't need any extra revelation from God. We don't need any extra confirmation. It's all in here. That's all we need for life and godliness. And that's why when we look at church history, we see miracles stopped right after the apostles died. It's because the message was closed. There was no new revelation being given. Therefore, no new miracles needed to be performed. Nothing needed to be confirmed. The gospel is inherently self-confirming. The gospel doesn't need extra things added to it. It doesn't. And that's one of the errors of the charismatic is that they say, well, we got to do miracle, we got to do this, we got to do that. To go along, to supplement the gospel, that's heresy. That's heresy. The gospel inherently, by its own merit, is powerful unto salvation. And so, just to say that, and so Jesus here performing his miracles is, what's the reason? To validate his teaching and his ministry. So, further validation on top of already the inherent validation that his ministry of teaching holds itself. And uh, as I said, the third thing. The crowd is astonished. And I just read that beginning part, uh, beginning of verse 27. They were all astonished. So that they debated among themselves saying, what is this? Now notice what they say. A teaching with authority. It's the same thing we found in verse 22. 
He commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him. Immediately the news spread about him everywhere and to all the surrounding district of Galilee. And so we find that Jesus amazes to the uttermost. And so the question for you is, has Jesus by His inherent power and by the gospel message, by His dead, burial, and resurrection, has it amazed you? Have you been amazed by the message of the gospel? Have you been like these crowds who beheld Jesus' miracles and beheld His teaching and you've never seen these things with a physical eye, but you behold through the eye of faith and you are amazed? Do you stand in amazement that Christ is Lord, God, and King over the church and over all things. If you do not, I encourage you to behold the glory of Christ. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Even you who are religious, the call is still the same. The Pharisees, the scribes, the chief priests had this call as well brought to them. Repent and believe the gospel. For you who are religious, the call is to self-examine, to look at one's heart and see whether it has been regenerate. To genuinely ask oneself, am I amazed by Christ? Am I amazed by the gospel? If so, certainly one is saved. But if not, they're not. And brethren, even the encouragement is unto you to stand once more amazed this day that Jesus Christ has the inherent power to simply, by His own word, command even the evil spirits and they obey Him. We know elsewhere, Jesus commands the winds and the waves, the power of the weather. We know from Genesis, He has the creative power. We know from Colossians 1, or Colossians 2, excuse me. He has the power not only to create everything, but to uphold it. To uphold it. Everything in this world is being upheld. The laws of nature and logic and gravity, everything is, is being held together by the power of Christ. And yet this infinite God became man. Limited himself. He limited himself. He became a man, humbled himself. It's glorious, brethren. That is amazing. And so we have seen here in Mark 1, 21-28, Jesus astounds through His teaching, through His exorcisms of the, of the demonically possessed. We find ourselves in light of the holiness of God having sinned against Him, as our father, Adam, as the, the federal head of the human race, who represented all people in that garden, sinned against God, broke the covenant of works. So too have we broke the covenant of works. We've lied and we have blasphemed God's name. We have disregarded the truth of God. And we've exchanged it, as Romans 1 says, we've exchanged the truth of God for a lie. And we have worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. And so we are, as, as, the, as the fallen angels, as Satan, we are condemned to go to the place that was originally not prepared for the wicked. But Scripture explicitly says it was prepared for Satan and his angels. But now it is as if the lake has been widened, the pit has been opened more, and the wicked, the souls of wicked men and women shall also go there. But praise be to God that in His grace, which astounds, which makes the, the sinner say, wow, what an amazing grace. He sent His Son Jesus who fulfilled the law and died upon the cross, bore His wrath against sin, so that sinners would not be blown into chaff, they would not be crushed eternally. And so, as the song says... On that cross where Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. And three days later, He was raised. And He's alive today. And the call is to repent and believe Him. To repent and believe that Christ Jesus is sufficient for salvation. And that by His own inherent power, He could save the most wicked, the most perverse sinner there is. 
He has saved me. And I am the chief among sinners. And therefore, He certainly can save you. And the promise of the Gospel is for all who repent and believe it, there is forgiveness of sin. There is perfect righteousness. The righteousness of Jesus Christ given as a gift of grace. And it is all for His glory. We think about how, why. This infinite God is... The infinite God of glory, the self-fulfilling God. We think about God did not need us and certainly we're more of a nuisance. God is self-sufficient, self-fulfilled. His subsistence is in Himself. He's self-pleased. He doesn't need us. We think about the Trinity existing eternally. The Father, Son, and Spirit in this beautiful love toward one another. This self-fulfillment. God did not need us. Yet, the second person of the Trinity came down and limited himself in such a manner and humbled himself in such a way so that even in his own ministry, when he spoke of his return, he said, the Son does not know, but the Father. He limited even his his infinite knowledge. He was limited in his perfect life. Limited his deity, veiled it for us. That's the glory of the gospel, my friends. That the glory of Christ is revealed in His coming and living such a humble life and dying such a humble death on behalf of His people. And so may Christ be glorified as the Word has gone forth and in your life and in mine and in all things as He upholds them. As He upholds them for His glory. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we praise You for Christ. We praise You for the Gospel of Christ. We praise You for the power of Christ and the astounding work of Christ. His teaching and His, His, His healing ministry, which we're going to see next week. And in His casting out demons. Father, may we stand in amazement as we behold through the eye of faith Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, And it is my prayer that He would be glorified. He would be glorified as the Spirit of God works, as you, Father, are even working to bring about all things whatsoever comes to pass. We pray these things in the power of Christ. Amen. Amen and amen.